Okay, so we should be live. Um, Larissa and Andres, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself for now. Thank you. And thank you everybody for, for being here. Uh, sad circumstances that we need to be uh, meeting under, but uh, hopefully, um, you know, we'll, we'll learn uh, a lot about kind of what's happening right now and, and just try to make uh, a little bit of sense uh, in terms of the current uh, developments in, in Ukraine and in Europe. So I'm going to start. My name is uh, Dominic Stetsua. I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Political Science. Um, I will be moderating today. Uh, one thing that I want to highlight is that I'm not a scholar of, of, uh, of Ukraine or of Russia or, or of international security. Uh, I do have some skin in the game in a sense that I am from Poland originally. My grandma is from uh, Elonorówka, which uh, is now Western Ukraine uh, near the city of Ternopil or Ter Ternopil in Ukrainian. Um, that used to be Poland before World War II. Uh, now it's Ukraine. So you know, you know, I have a personal connection, obviously, friends and, 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 and colleagues in that region. So, so I'm, I'm personally invested, but I don't have a lot of expertise, um, which is why I, 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 I helped to put this panel together to just to get some knowledge about kind of what is happening and, and just trying to make sense of, of kind of the, the reasons why we're seeing what we're seeing. And, and, and trying to kind of understand the consequences and, and any kind of possible ways in which this, this uh, horrible conflict, uh, horrible invasion of, of Russia on Ukraine can, can end. So the people who will help us make sense of this are, are three fantastic experts. We have Dr. Uh, Larissa Doroshenko. She's a postdoctoral associate at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, Dr. Doroshenko uh, received her PhD in communication from uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her uh, research explores how marginalized groups use emerging media to gain power in authoritarian regimes, and she has done a fair amount of work on the dark side of online media. She studied populism, nationalism, disinformation campaigns, trolls, bots, all of these things. So, so she will have uh, very interesting things uh, to say about the more uh, the information part of this of, of the current war. Uh, then we have Dr. Peter Harris, uh, who's an associate professor and my colleague here in the Department of Political Science at CSU. Uh, Dr. Harris received his PhD in political science from the University of Texas at Austin. His work focuses on international security and US foreign policy, and he will discuss the implications of the Russian invasion in Ukraine for the international order, the United States, and the West more broadly. Um, and then we have um, Andras uh, Tot uh, Cifra. He's a political analyst from Hungary based in New York City. He is a senior analyst at Flashpoint Intelligence, focusing on security and cybersecurity issues related to Europe and Russia and a non-resident fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis, SIPA. He specializes in Russian and Eastern European politics and regularly publishes analyses on Russian affairs. And he will discuss politics in Russia that led to the invasion. And, and my co-moderator co, um, uh, today will be uh, Irene Marinova. Irene is a PhD candidate in our department here um, in political science, and Iran actually studies the European Union and its geopolitical uh, place in global politics. So she will share some of her insights and, 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 and kind of help me navigate our conversation later on. So how the panel will proceed is that we will uh, start by getting every panelist uh, uh, to, to talk about the thing uh, that they want to talk about for about 10 minutes or so. They'll focus on their kind of area of expertise, and then we'll focus on conversation. We'll have some questions, and I definitely encourage all of the people in the audience to, to utilize the, um, the, the Q&A uh, button and, and ask any questions that come to mind. So I'm going to shut up now, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Doroshenko uh, to, to start 
Uh, and again, thank you. Thank you all to the panelists for being here and, and to all of you for joining us today. All right, so I'm gonna unmute myself. Um, let me know if you can hear me fine. Yes, great, fantastic. Um, so thank you so much, Dominic, for this wonderful introduction. Thank you for inviting me to this panel. Um, thank you for organizing it. Uh, I prepared a couple of slides uh, to share with you. Um, and as Dominic said, I'll be talking about disinformation campaigns and um, during the current war in Ukraine. So without further ado, so um, the um, basis right, for this my kind of expertise in disinformation campaigns and specifically disinformation campaigns in the United States comes from the article that we recently published. Uh, the data is uh, the data that we used was revealed uh, by Twitter, uh, made it public, said that this were the IRA accounts uh, that was in 2017. And we just happened to have at the University of Wisconsin-Madison at the time, um, uh, just a random 10% archive of tweets collected during that time period. Uh, so what we did is we uh, looked back at the archive and we were able to extract those tweets sent by those handles that Twitter made public. So we use this ground truth data to figure out what Russian trolls were talking about during the war, uh, during the war, or like during the military conflict, I guess, at that time in Donbass. And uh, by doing that, we uh, use this theoretical framework of reflex reflexive control, which was up and down by communication scholars and disinformation scholars uh, for a while. Um, but that strategy was used uh, a lot during Cold War and during the disinformation campaigns back then. So what we argue in this paper is that Russia is has adopted those strategies to digital realm right now. And by you looking at these patterns rather than specific instances of disinformation, we are much better equipped to understand its goals and consequences. Uh, so what are those reflexive control, like 4D kind of core strategies? Is the distort, and I think that's where we were as community, as a scholarly community, but also as a people consuming information being uh, more dragged into, like distorting like fake news, right? Not presenting the information correctly, dismissing or like just not admitting something, um, but akin to lying, but not really, um, you know, just denying your involvement in a sense. Uh, distraction, um, you know, just kind of putting this red herring argument and distracting attention to other issues uh, and dismaying just escalating situations and playing like scare games. And I would argue that while we were focusing on this fake news, kind of distorting or dismissing information, we were really, um, again, as a community, myself included, not necessarily paying attention to the issues that can be, uh, the strategies that can be distracting or dismaying. Uh, and that's where um, we have to be more vigilant. And another thing that comes out of, re of this research is that we started, as I mentioned, uh, with the Twitter handles. But as we started to analyze type of tweets sent during that time, we quickly realized that a lot of these tweets were referring to a lot to several propaganda websites. So essentially, these uh, websites they had Twitter handle associated with that, just as many um, like news or news like platforms have, um, and they used Twitter um, and also other social media platforms to spread information about these websites. So it wasn't just Twitter. And as we also know in Russia, Twitter is not really that popular or in Ukraine for the same reason. Um, so all of these propaganda websites, they also had other social media platforms such as uh, VK, Russian version of Facebook, Adnaklasniki, something similar network for former classmates, uh, Telegram, which is a fairly new uh, messenger, but also used a lot as a source of information these days. Uh, and Viber, I'm not I'm aware it's not Russian, but I put it here because it's highly popular and also being used as a channel for just spreading information. So you can sub subscribe to a channel and just receive news uh, in the Viber channel as well. Um, so what are we seeing right now? So having this background knowledge, what are we seeing now? How do we, um, how does the situation unfold? So I argue that for uh, domestic or Russian speaking audiences, uh, we see some strategies of dismissing, such as, well, there is no conversation trying to suppress the uh, any mentions of losses at war, not admitting them. It's not clear how much troops Russia lost because the figures are so vastly different between what Ukrainians report and Russians report. 
um, also dismissing of the um, targeting of a civil objects and just saying, no, it's not happening. We have this very targeted um, use of weapons. Um, so also distorting. So that's where kind of the pre created pretense for this invasion is talking about this Nazi and fascist government and also protecting Russian speaking population. So that kind of textbook didn't change much since 2014. I'm not sure why, maybe they run out of ideas. Um, and then distracting part, it's it really important. A lot of conversations in like Russian speaking audience, but also I think it penetrates also to the uh, foreign audiences a little bit is conversation of like, oh, the war has been going for eight years. Where have you been all this time? Or also talking about the Minsk agreements. And I'm happy to kind of dive more into those strategies if you would like. Um, but overall, they're kind of like, again, they're distracting from the issue at hand which is invasion and a full-blown war um, as of now. And none of that was happening in 2014 is comparable, comparable to the scale of what's going on right now. Um, but there's also foreign audiences. And here, I think that the disinformation strategies employed right now are circulating. Um, they are different and they're more subtle. So one of them is emphasis on racial issues. So I've seen um, at least you know, on Twitter, but also on some Russian uh, propaganda telegram channels, a lot of conversation of how, um, or like emphasizing how, uh, you know, Ukrainians are like racist or also like black communities siding with the Russian propaganda and a similar narrative that I just discussed. So this, for example, is taken from one of the Russian um, telegram um, channels that spreads a lot of this kind of narrative so for Russian domestic audience. And yet they're using this uh, type of slogans taken from American Twitter to kind of show how Americans are divided and um, you know they don't really care about their um, black people, right? Uh, similarly, there's also this emphasis on anti-immigrant attitudes and kind of saying how um, the, all of the conversation, how Poland or other European countries were not receptive to immigrants uh, trying to uh, get through the border just a couple of months ago. And now out of a sudden they do accept refugees. Like, so not all refugees are created equal. And there's been a lot of conversation. I think it's actually dominating. I think you are the one retweeting it. So I'm putting it here. Um, so this is a conversation about how Indian students were discriminated at the Poland border and there was a video. And some afterwards uh, trying to um, verify this information and realizing that um, uh, the license plates were not even from the Polish border. So probably that video is was true, but not taking taking completely out of context and out of time frame. Um, another part is exacerbating partisan divides. So I'm sure we've all heard how um, Trump was praising Putin just um, a week ago, and also similar patterns we've seen. Um, you know, I also again took it from the Russian uh, Telegram channel, um, making Russia rich again, and saying how how somehow Biden's uh, policies are trying to enrich Russia, or also I've seen a lot of conversation and narrative that, oh, we, Biden um, pays more attention to Russian Ukrainian border, we better focus on our southern borders. Um, and also exacerbating divisions within the European Union. Um, so here I also have this, maybe I'm looking forward to hearing what my uh, Hungarian colleague has to say. Um, again, that tweet also comes from the Russian Telegram channel saying that, well, we are deeply concerned um, and but we should not, be dragged into war. So kind of again, in similar narrative we've also seen with Germany, for example. Uh, dismaying taxes we've all seen as well, uh, type of nuclear war threats kind of again, um, escalating also on the Russian side, getting all of this um, like troops or like all of this kind of military uh, ready and uh, kind of threatening with that. And US responded with de-escalating actually. Um, but also like the conversations about anti-NATO expansion and saying that, oh, we were wrong, actually, we shouldn't have expanded NATO. It wouldn't have happened if we, did, if we didn't do that. So it's kind of our fault. We're taking responsibility for it and Russia is right. Um, and here I also have this example also coming from Dominic's from yesterday, the New Yorker uh, interview uh, where in the question, where do we think we should be doing in Ukraine right now? Says we should be pivoting out of Europe would be working over time to create friendly relations with the Russians because we need to balance in coalition against China. So again, all of this type of conversations, I'm not saying they're coming from Russia necessarily, 
but I'm saying there are amplified, there's evidence of it already, there are amplified by Russian propaganda because the goal, it serves them to distract and dismay. Um, and what type of tools they are using. So one of them has been very prevalent and that what we haven't seen before in 2014 is the uh, proliferation of Telegram in Eastern Europe specifically, but I know it also is getting more popular in the United States. And I also know it's been getting more popular among far right circles uh, in this country. Um, so, so the ones that I've been able to spot, thanks to my Ukrainian friends, um, is are the ones targeted for uh, Russian audiences, so they're in Russian language. I do not exclude there also exist in other languages, I just am not aware of them. Um, and they're targeted at Russians living in Poland. We see here we have this uh, PL Serenka, um, like right here. And uh, we also have the, um, like Belgium, we also have Brussels Info, we also have some USA periodical uh, or Russ, Russ Orientalist. So that's for, East, uh, for the Far East. So all of this, you know, kind of like using local agenda and also blending into the Russian propaganda. Um, another one is Russian social media platforms, obviously, which we cannot regulate because there's so the VK, uh, the Telegram and Adnoklasniki. Um, and also there are already a lot of existing accounts on Twitter or Facebook or Reddit or Instagram. So I, we've, again, those platforms try to eradicate Russian trolls, but it doesn't mean that all of them are gone. And I know there are more, no more, I think, Twitter prohibited new registration from Russia, but I don't think um, they like they would even go as far as to eliminate um, those existing accounts from Russia, for example. Uh, obviously, the propaganda websites continue working, very popular in Russia still. So this is the website that we know for sure was affiliated with the Internet Research Agency in 2013, still working. Its audience is bigger than it was uh, eight years ago. And that's what its web page, front page looked like um, yesterday. Um, and obviously useful idiots. That's a propaganda term. I'm not using curse words here, or like bad words. Um, so those are the, those foreign politicians and activists that are just mindlessly, um, oftentimes not intentionally repeat Russian propaganda narratives uh, and also Russian citizens abroad. So as far as I know, uh, quite a few Russians voted for Trump last elections and Again, those type of citizens, some of them, there were a few of them, obviously, but some of them still side with their relatives in Russia and do support invasion in Ukraine. And they're also um, citizens of other countries and they have the right to vote. Um, so that's all that I have. It took a little bit longer, um, 12 minutes. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Looking forward to your questions. And here's my contact information, uh, would you like, if, should you like to follow up. Thank you so much, Larissa. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Peter now. Thank you, uh, Larissa. That was really fascinating. And uh, thank you, Dom, for organizing the panel, taking the initiative. I uh, very much appreciate that. And thank you, everyone, for attending. I I'll try and be succinct. Um, I want to try and give three explanations for the war um, and then conclude with some difficult questions for the panelists and, and for the for the for the audience about how the war could have been avoided how the war ends and, and, and what comes next I want to emphasize that uh, I'm not trying to justify the war uh, the, the the title of the panel is making sense of the crisis I think we could all agree there's 136 participants online right now that the war is is senseless in the sense that it's unnecessary, it's cruel. It was a war of choice. Um, the fault lies with Vladimir Putin. We can all agree that it's a, it's a tragedy. But as a social scientist, I don't think the wars happen at random. They don't happen by chance. There's a set of factors that drive them and it's incumbent upon us to try and grasp what might be what might have caused the war because I, especially because i think it has implications for how the war ends and and like i said what comes next so like three explanations i think are particularly worth us considering the first is what i call the the irrational explanation and this is just that putin is a madman right? he's, he's bad he's mad he's cruel he's driven by ideology 
he's driven by, um, you know, he, he may be unhinged in some way and I'm sending to Marco Rubio. Marco Rubio has been making some kind of veiled or not so veiled suggestions that Putin might have lost his mind. Uh, it's possible, right? People in the world can be bad or mad and they can do things that we regard as, as irrational. So he, he may be behaving irrationally. He may hate Ukraine. He may be driven by irredentism, wanting to kind of reconquer this kind of Soviet or czarist empire. If that's the case, there's probably very little that could have been done to stop the war. I mean, no, there's nothing that you could offer Putin that would satisfy him. If he's a, a Hitler-like figure, then he was driven to do this from the beginning, and there's very little that anybody in Ukraine or the West could have done to, to prevent it. It's possible. The second and third explanations, though, assume that war is a means to an end, and they invite us to ask difficult questions about what the end, the goal, the strategic aim uh, might be for, for Putin and his advisors. These are, these are more difficult explanations because they ask us to understand the horrific. Like they ask, ask us to try and rationalize and explain and make sense of things that we agree are tragic and horrific and inhumane. Uh, some people don't like the word rational, then you can substitute the word intentional, right? The war is an intentional act of Vladimir Putin to gain some kind of uh, advantage or goal. The first of these explanations is that Putin wants some kind of sphere of influence in, in Ukraine and maybe Eastern Europe as a whole. Um, maybe Putin thinks that as a great power, Russia deserves a sphere of influence. This is about status and prestige. Um, and it, it, he may also believe that Russia needs a sphere of influence, kind of a, a buffer zone between it and Central and Western Europe um, for reasons of national security. For 20, 25, 30 years, Russian leaders have made clear that the expansion of NATO up to Russia's borders was unacceptable to them, that they regarded it as threatening. We can discuss in the Q&A whether or not that's a reasonable claim of theirs. I think there's considerable reason to doubt whether Ukraine, the poorest country in Europe, could ever be con conceivably pose a threat to Russia with the largest military in Europe and the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. But that's what they say. That's what Putin said. That's what Yeltsin said. That's what Gorbachev said. That's what every Russian leader since um, the early 1990s has said. From this view, the war could have been stopped if Ukraine had simply capitulated, if it had agreed to neutrality, if it had agreed to demilitarize, if it had agreed to never join NATO. There's a chance that Putin could have been dissuaded from invading Ukraine. And from this view, the war ends when President Zelensky gives up those things now. Um, I think we should discuss in the Q&A how credible this explanation is. Uh, people have pointed out that in 2014, Ukraine was neutral according to its constitution, and that did not prevent Russia from invading and annexing Crimea. So there's some skepticism about whether or not Russia is truly interested in a neutral Ukraine, but this is a possible explanation, right? It's a possible explanation that Putin felt threatened or offended in some way regarded as intolerable that uh, Ukraine was considering aligning with the Western powers and that he has now entered Ukraine to, to fix what could not be fixed politically. He wants to dismember Ukraine, destabilize Ukraine, maybe install a different leader. But one way or another, get what he wants in terms of Ukraine's foreign policy being subordinated to the um, desires of Russia. The third explanation is, is, is even more terrifying in my view than the first and the second. And this is that what Putin is trying to achieve in Ukraine is to impress upon Europe as a whole that this concept of indivisible security captures something meaningful in Europe. The concept of indivisible security has been mentioned a few times by uh, Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister in particular, it's in a number of European-wide treaties um, since the end of the Cold War. It essentially, it means that 
the countries of Europe recognize that their security is connected to one another, that no country can strengthen its security at the expense of others. Um, all countries have to take into consideration the security interests of others, uh, of their neighbors. Russia contends in its official kind of language that Ukraine's actions made Russia feel insecure. The NATO expansion to include Poland and the Baltic states made Russia feel insecure. And the indivisible security was being cast aside by the West and the West needed to, to stop behaving this way and instead restructure the whole European security order in such a way that Russia felt safe, satisfied, um, and content. This would mean an end to all NATO expansion, not just Ukraine, but no more states in NATO. This would mean pulling back NATO forces to 1997 uh, posture. So out of no NATO forces rotating in and out of the Baltic states, no NATO forces in, in, in Poland, pulling all the way back to, to Germany, essentially. All the guarantees that Russia demands, none of this was granted by the West, right? All non-starters, completely non-negotiable. There's no way that we're going to change our foreign policy in response to you holding a gun to the head of Ukraine. Um, negotiations went nowhere in the run-up to this war. And the, the really horrific, horrifying, in my view, horrific prospect is that what Russia is, is trying to do, what Putin is trying to do in Ukraine, is cause so much carnage, so much devastation, uh, cause so many people to flee their homes, disrupt and the economy to such an extent that nobody in Europe can deny that the concept of indivisible security means something. By squeezing Ukraine, by breaking the bones of, of the Ukrainian state, Putin can make people in London, in Madrid, Paris and Berlin feel real pain. By economic pain, but also psychological pain, because he knows that we hate to see the people of Ukraine suffer. From this view, the war ends when the rest of Europe and the United States come back to the negotiating table, admit to Putin that we were wrong, and that we should have conceded his more maximalist demands in Europe in order to secure peace in Europe. I've written in a opinion piece last week that what Putin wants is the West to come back to the negotiating table with the blood drained from our faces because we're so appalled and we're so horrified by what he did that we now accept European-wide changes are needed to the European kind of security architecture. I just want to conclude by saying that all wars end at some point. They can end in weeks, months, or decades, but all, all wars end. They end when both sides agree that fighting will not get them what they want. Ukraine already knows that fighting will not get them what they want, right? So Ukraine would sign a peace treaty right now if one was put in a ceasefire deal right now if one was put in front of President Zelensky. Russia will only stop fighting when it gets what it wants, right? Putin will only stop fighting when he thinks he cannot get what he wants through the loss of more Russian and Ukrainian lives. At some point, we have to ask some really difficult questions then about what is Ukraine and what are Ukraine's friends in Europe and the United States willing to give up to make the pain stop? Are we willing to, to say that Ukraine can never join NATO and the European Union? Are we willing to pull NATO forces out of the Baltics and Poland? Are we willing to give Russia all kinds of security guarantees that we don't think it needs, that we think is unreasonable, but we need to do anyway. How badly do we want peace? What are we willing to sacrifice for it? Um, these are extremely difficult questions. Right? I think in the West, we're used to having peace on our own terms because we tend to be the most powerful actor in conflicts in which we are involved. The kind of horrific thing to face up to in Ukraine is that we might have to accept peace on, on Putin's terms if we want the suffering uh, to end. Um, and that's extremely difficult to come to terms with, but, but we, we, we may have to uh, at some point. So again, I'll just conclude by saying it's a senseless war, it's a cruel war, it's an unnecessary war, it's a, it's a war of choice and the blame uh, falls squarely on the shoulders of, of Vladimir Putin. 
but it doesn't get us anywhere, right? At some point, the war has to end and, and peace needs to be established in Ukraine and Europe as a whole. Uh, what, what are we willing to do to get that peace? I don't, I don't know the answer to the question of what we should offer uh, Vladimir Putin for, for lasting peace in Europe, but assuming he stays in power, which looks likely, we'll, we'll have to offer something. And um, you know, I'd like to hear people's thoughts on that, and I, and I have thoughts on that, but um, I guess I'll, I'll conclude there for now. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, and last but not least, uh, Andras. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much for the um, invitation. I will start by saying that I am uh, happy to talk about uh, Hungary's position in the Q&A or afterwards. Uh, obviously, since as a Hungarian citizen, as a political analyst. Uh, but right now, I'm going to talk about the domestic circumstances, which is domestic political hinterland that uh, influences this war, may influence the outcome, um, and that I think we should um, take a closer look at. Um, the first thing is, first of all, before I start this first slide, Something that I always say whenever I'm invited to one of these panels uh, is that uh, you uh, that uh, I hope I'm going to uh, be interesting and I will offer insights to you, but also I would like to encourage everyone to go out and uh, hear uh, the pros uh, perspectives of Ukrainian uh, journalists, Ukrainian citizens. There are a lot of them who are still on the internet. Um, the internet is still working in Ukraine, um, you should go and talk to them and listen to them and support them. So first of all, what are we what we're looking at in Russia is essentially an isolating autocracy. This is an isolation that certainly um, certainly sped up, certainly uh, accelerated in 2020 to 2021, uh, while Putin basically spent the whole duration of the pandemic so far hold up uh, in uh, a safe, uh, well, let's call it the bunker, as many Russians uh, have been calling it, with extreme restrictions on who can access them, uh, who can access them. But this isolation did not start in 2020. It started earlier. It started earlier in uh, 2014. I would say it started around that time with Putin's withdrawal gradually first and then extremely from day-to-day -day politics. So this, I think we political analysts, when we were estimating the chances of an all-out war, we underestimated the effects of this isolation. And COVID also, um, apart from isolating Putin even further and blocking access to him even further and probably blocking the information that reached him even further, um, I suspect had another, um, had another effect, potential effect on the course of events, namely that it impacted uh, Russia's development plans. There was a positive agenda of state-driven development, which many of us thought was Putin's real plan for 2014. Uh, 2024, sorry, when his current term ends, um, to kickstart economic growth through state-driven investments. The pandemic has resulted in a setback in these plans, and uh, we can suspect that those who wanted to push these plans failed to convince Putin that these would make a big enough difference. Uh, obviously, with the war, these plans are as good as that. So, the rationality problem that Peter also spoke about is, um, I, I also was thinking about that a lot at the beginning of this, um, of this current assault in Ukraine. Uh, I would not, uh, many have said that Putin behaved irrationally. I also wouldn't say that he behaved irrationally. He probably, based on the information that he has and based on uh, the viewpoint that he has, he probably thinks that he is 
uh, behaving very, he's uh, uh, taking uh, rational decisions. But if we can see, if, if, but if we consider that uh, from our point of view, this is still a madness, and but he thinks that he's behaving rationally, and therefore, as Peter said, it's intentional, it's a work of choice, then I think that it has to influence how what, what we think is imaginable in the coming weeks, how far Putin is willing to go. And of course, not only our um, perception of that, but the perception uh, inside Russia. Um, there is an explanation which says that um, some of the more, let's say, unhinged statements that Putin has made over the past couple of days, including uh, the thinly veiled, uh, uh, thinly veiled threats of uh, putting uh, Russia's nuclear forces on high alert, um, are part of a strategy that Putin had used before, namely uh, to convince the adversaries that uh, he is prepared to go all in to scare them and uh, for them to, to then back down because, uh, uh, because of the elevated sort of idea of the risks that, they, that, that the adversaries would think Putin is ready to take, but they are not. But usually this happened in, in other, uh, usually Putin used other means. Usually Putin used deeds more than words when sort of ramping up the threat and, uh, uh, and, and acting irrationally. Uh, so this is certainly a new quality. I think we are in uncharted territory here. This is a new quality, a new, um, uh, quality of speech, uh, even compared to Putin's uh, former utterances. Uh, can, this, uh, can this care people inside Russia? Can this care the elite? Can this influence what they see, uh, what, how they perceive the, um, uh, the president and what, they, and, and what he's doing? It's questionable. Uh, first of all, the elite is used to Putin winning such uh, confrontations. And I'm not sure what degree of miscalculation is enough to suddenly convince them that in this particular case, he miscalculated. Uh, I do believe that the degree exists, but I don't know if we are there. In a way, the domestic political situation in Russia in recent years, and this I think came out very well in the, uh, in the past week, was the coexistence of a short-sighted personalized autocracy um, that keeps its sight on 2024, the 2024 problem, uh, and a emerging digital authoritarianism, which had a longer perspective that, uh, that um, was spearheaded by the government of Mikhail Mishustin that aimed to construct a sort of a more effective state that is able to invest, that is able to, do, uh, to conduct a development strategy, that is able to collect a lot of information and use it. Um, and the problem was, in a way, that these coexisted. The, the reforms could not penetrate, the, the reforms that took place in the form of the second state could not penetrate the first. Uh, we have um, information from from investigative news outlets against Bo, for instance, wrote about this, uh, that um, suggesting that uh, a lot of the, a lot of uh, members of the government and indeed military commanders also uh, learned of the war plans at a very late stage. So that gave them very little time to prepare. The preparation of the population itself was also very poor to the war. They did not, um, the war was regarded as a special operation uh, that would be over very soon, and that there and and uh, the uh, potential maximum amount of and and impact of sanctions was massively downplayed. So the question is, what can you even a what, what can a competent government, even if we say that Michelin's government is a competent government, what can a competent government do in these circumstances? I'm not sure. Um, sorry. So I think this only, uh, these quite, like we can, we, uh, the, the other thing that we need to uh, take a look at is domestic attitudes to the war. Now, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, a pollster. I do not do surveying myself. So I'm going to uh, rely on uh, surveys done mostly by the Vada Center uh, 
for these points, the short point that I'm making and, uh, and other Russian pollsters whom I trust. So is there an anti war constituency in Russia? As James Volkov, the um, head of Lagada Center said uh, in one of these days, two thirds of Russians do not uh, perceive what is going on in Ukraine. They do not know, uh, they may have an attitude about war, but they do not perceive that this is a war. One third of Russians, um, he estimated are against the war. Will they rally? Will they make their opposition to the war known? Well, many have already. Um, we know about 7,600 7, people, more than 7,600 people arrested as of I think, the end of the day yesterday. Um, there was no pro-war rally, which also suggests that, that the pro-war constituency is, uh, the active pro-war constituency is probably smaller. We have a lot of celebrities coming out, even though uh, they know that uh, the, uh, taking an anti-war stance can have consequences uh, for them. Uh, but this is all happening in the context of a circumstances that have been worsening over the past years. Uh, uh, to borrow uh, Melville's phrase, uh, sorry, Hemingway's phrase, um, um, gradually and then suddenly. There was a gradual um, there, was a, there was a gradual worsening of repression of dissent in Russia even before 2021. But in 2021, uh, the situation has changed rapidly for much worse. And what we see now is uh, basically builds on the fear that, uh, that the authorities were able to create in 2021 uh, when they both shut down most of the country's independent media, which they are finishing right now and instill fear in people so that they do not go out and protest. Um, but there is a contradiction between, uh, between the reality and the propaganda uh, that Russian citizens have heard over the past couple of years. For instance, they uh, were exposed to pro-military propaganda, which told them that the Russian military was now a state-of-the-art force that is able to deal with the exact situations that uh, the Russian government now says they are dealing with in Ukraine relatively fast. They were exposed to propaganda also, but mostly an attempt to build a new government legitimacy based on government capacity and, uh, and, and competence, which is going to be tested and probably fail in face of uh, the recent sanctions because this is, these are, uh, the, the, the effects are much bigger than what the government has test driven these capacities for. So, we can say that the ground is shifting. We don't know if it's fast enough. Fast enough for what? Fast enough to create an anti-war constituency that people who actually have or may have influence at the flow of events at the top and who have better uh, information than many of, many of Russian citizens and maybe also Putin um, can build on. Uh, this is why I would say that one of the most important things that we need to uh, be looking at in the coming days, weeks, is to keep information channels open so that raw footage, uh, actual news can reach Russian citizens for as long as possible, and maybe also broaden this channel. And I end here, what now? Well, I mentioned that, uh, that uh, the possible feedback of uh, the uh, popular grant shifting on elites. Again, this, this, uh, we are trying to read the elites here at this point. Uh, what we can know is that the lead consensus in this, uh, in, in this situation of such pressure can be sustained only unless there is a clear alternative. We probably know that the elites have access to better information than the population and perhaps in Putin, so there's the responsibility, there's a larger responsibility on them. They probably also have uh, more resources to mitigate the effects of, uh, uh, of, of dissent, of uh, crackdown on dissent. We have seen certain fissures. Um, I mentioned the military and the government being poorly informed about the war. Uh, foreign reputation, we can talk about it in the Q&A, the, uh, the sort of the groundswell that uh, ha has happened in uh, the European Union mostly. Uh, against uh, Russian oligarchs and, uh, uh, and, and uh, 
support for NATO membership of uh, both Ukraine and uh, Finland and Sweden, which can which will impact uh, the what 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 Russian the moneyed class can do uh, in the near future. Um, the loss of rent from the uh, mostly from the development projects that that which will now have to be uh, postponed or just written off. And the strange loyalty test that Putin has submit, uh, submitted the first the security and then the uh, business elite at New York the days of the invasion suggests that uh, he is not he might not be completely sure about uh, the political support that he has. And the caveats: Does this mean that Putin perceives that he has a closing window and he needs to make a large difference in a short amount of time and therefore will, will this lead him to escalate? We don't know. And the second question, is there a hypothetical agreement that even if we wanted to end the war and even if Ukraine wanted to end the war and say Ukraine agreed to certain terms and the West supported certain terms, is there an agreement that satisfies Putin, can be enforced in Ukraine and the West can trust a Russia led by Putin not to tear up next year? Or is it, or, or have we decided that as long as Putin is in power, this issue is not going to be settled? And what are the implications of that? So thank you very much. I will end here. Thank you so much, Andres. And, and thank you to Peter and Larissa as well. So we have just over 25 minutes left. So please be mindful of time. There's a lot of questions that people have been asking. Uh, let's try to get through most of them. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Irene Marinova, and she's going to lead the Q&A. Thank you, Dom, and thank you to um, all of you for these very insightful presentations and perspectives on the different angles of how we can um, look at the war in Ukraine. Uh, there are a lot of questions, that Dom, as Dom said, so uh, I'll try to focus on the most pressing ones or you know questions that have the most interest so um let's begin with uh what the response by the west has been so far in deterring putin in convincing him to stop the war first of all uh and it's a question for all three of you um will the sanctions be enough and effective and if no uh, what else can the u.s NATO and the rest of the world do to stop Putin? Um, and can we risk and should we risk um, direct engagement through NATO? Uh, perhaps we can start in the order we presented. We can start with Larissa, Peter, and um, Andres last. Uh, sure. Um, OK. So. Uh... Uh, when it comes to uh, like sanctions, um, I, I well, the sanctions are completely unprecedented, right? So a lot of experts were selling, were saying how it's hard to estimate even historically what they're going to do because we've never seen sanctions of that magnitude in history before. Um, talking from the perspective of um, the, you know, I'm originally from Belarus. I just happened to study Ukraine because there, there's a lot more was has have been going on there uh, compared to my home country, but uh, Belarus was isolated by sanctions uh, in 2020. Um, they were not obviously as severe. And it, it would take toll in the long term perspective, but we also see the example of the North Korea, which is isolated by sanctions and is still doing poorly, but holding to its ideology. So I don't know if Russia could be a large North Korea in this case. Um, and if it is, it's, scary. it's a scary scenario. Um, so I don't know if sanctions alone would be capable of deterring it. It might lead to a coup um, within the country. That is a possibility. Uh, but I don't know if it's going to be like if we're just taking everything as is and just waiting for the sanctions to work. I just don't think they would have an effect in the nearest future, at least in the nearest future, we're talking about Ukraine still being on the map and not taking over. Um, and, you know, because if we're talking about like a year or like half a year even, right, it's it's a lot, it's already been a week and we've seen absolutely devastating consequences for civilian uh, population and also like, you know, for the infrastructure. And um, 
when it comes to the like oh, wait. so the second part of the question was about like can we listen to Putin or um sorry it was actually a three-part question okay, right <laughs> so the second part was uh what can the rest of the world do what can the u.s and nato okay. do more and can and should we risk direct involvement yeah, with NATO? Mm -hmm. um honestly i think that's been a lot being done in terms of like getting military support to ukraine uh in terms of like helping it financially in terms of imposing sanctions on russia uh, I'm afraid, I mean, again, like, I don't want to be like, the doomsday per person here, but I'm afraid that NATO would have to be involved at some point uh, if that continues the way that it goes right now. Because uh, Russia is like, has, like, you know, Ukrainians are doing great, but Russia has a lot of kind of resources, unless they're, I mean, and we also saw precedents during World War II when they were shooting um, those people who were trying to desert from the army, especially in the first days of, or like, first months of war because they were really had no arms to fight Germans and they were just sending them and they had people behind them so they would shoot if they tried to uh, turn around. So maybe they would start doing that if Russian men don't want to fight anymore. Uh, so I don't know, it's all kind of like very doomsday and I'm sorry to be non-optimistic, um, but I'm afraid that NATO might get involved at some point, like at least the close in the spine and whatnot. And if we do it later, we'll lose more Ukrainian lives, we'll lose more infrastructure, we'll lose also some historical sites that are impossible to rebuild. We might also be even facing some type of bombing of like their nuclear stations or uh, Chernobyl. I don't know, I don't know. But I'm just afraid that it might happen anyways, but if it happens later, it uh, Ukrainians or in the world might have higher costs of it. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, Peter? So I would say sanctions will not stop the war. Uh, for one thing, you know, I think what the West has imposed is a, an enormous amount of inconvenience on Russian businesses and consumers, but people are not going to de depose Vladimir Putin because of an enormous amount of inconvenience. If we stopped purchasing oil and gas, from uh, Russia. I think some private firms have stopped purchasing oil and gas from Russia because it's become an untouchable asset. But if those exports were cut off completely, that could have an effect, but we're, we're not willing to do that. Um, so I, the sanctions won't end the war. What will end the war is uh, Putin achieving a military victory, basically, right? Where he achieves a military victory on the battlefield and is able to impose terms on Zelensky. Uh, and the only way we can hasten that is to give something up, right? And I think that's a hard reality for people in the West to swallow. But if we want to hasten the end of this war, I think it means giving things up that we wouldn't give up two weeks ago. Um, I'm really pessimistic the Western leaders want to give up anything to Putin. They view him as a uh, <laughs> And he is, you know, the, the worst aggressor in the world at this point. So no one wants to make a deal with somebody like that. So what are we left with? We're left with the Ukrainian people throwing Molotov cocktails at tanks and being cut down to ribbons in the streets. And then at some point, um, Putin will achieve a military victory and, and, and impose terms. It's, it's grim, it's horrible, uh, but that's kind of the way I see the war ending. I do not see NATO intervening militarily, uh, whether it's a no-fly zone or anything else. Because to do so would be to risk World War Three with nuclear weapons, and uh, no one in NATO, um, I presume, will, is willing to take that risk. Even supplying arms to Ukraine is dangerous. Uh, once Russian soldiers are being killed by NATO-supplied arms, if Ukrainians fire missiles received from the West into Russian territory, if Ukrainian fighters move across borders and try and set up bases in Poland, if Russia chases Ukrainian fighters into Poland or another NATO country, already we're at risk of uh, escalating a terrible war into something more terrible. Um, I don't see NATO intervening militarily. Could be wrong, but I don't, don't see that happening. Um, there is a follow-up question uh, by Dom that just popped up um, for Peter. And does the calculus change if NATO countries are invaded? 
Yes. And I don't think it will happen. I think if, I think article five means something, but attack on one is attack on all. Um, and I think Putin knows that. And I don't think a NATO country will be attacked. It's precisely why he doesn't want Ukraine in NATO, because it would become much more difficult for him to impose his will on Ukraine if it, if it was in NATO. Um, I think Article 5 means something. And I think if a NATO country was attacked, we, we would be in a World War Three situation. I mean, we'd better hope that our leaders could de-escalate and we'd, we'd better hope that nuclear weapons wouldn't be released. Um, but those kind of situations are just incredibly difficult to control and to prevent them from escalating. And if a NATO country was attacked, um, certainly if it was a clear intentional attack and not some kind of stray missile landed in you know a field in Romania or something that no no one was killed if it was an intentional attack absolutely and then it's very dangerous I mean this is a really dangerous situation I mean already it's a terrible war taking an, an, a huge toll on the Ukrainian people of course um, it, as horrible as it is it could get even worse you know Okay, so um, I also don't see NATO intervening uh, presently, unless, of course, a NATO uh, member state is attacked, in which case, yes, NATO would be uh, obliged to intervene. But right now, I don't even, uh, for, for two reasons, like uh, President Biden, I think, um, stated even before the, the, the present uh, renewed invasion started that uh, NATO would not get involved. I think uh, that was uh, purp uh, the purpose of that statement was to remove even the um, uh, the uh, the possibility from the table before the pressure would grow as it does now. To uh, a lot of people are calling for establishing a non-fly zone, which again is I don't think some not one thing is going to happen. Or it should happen uh, because that no-fly zone can be forced, but we can. Uh, but, but one thing that the West can do is um, do something in between sanctions and the no-fly zone. For instance, safe zones could be established. Those are usually established by negotiation, and there's precedent for Russia keeping to those safe zones. Would it happen now? I have no idea. It requires, obviously, negotiations. Uh, it, it then weapon supplies, however risky they are, we, we have seen the cert that, uh, that NATO countries think that certain weapon supplies are less risky than others. So uh, anti-tank weapons, for instance, have already been supplied, while fighter jets have not been supplied. So I think there's a fine line in the risk perception of NATO and EU member states. As for sanctions, uh, to me, it is it seems like the uh, the scale and the speed of the sanctions suggest that the EU, uh, the UK and the US want to deliver a short, sharp blow, which would lead to a fairly relatively quick change in the situation in Russia. Um, I would say that the, for, as far as economic sanctions are concerned, the, the effects rather of economic sanctions are concerned, the worst is yet to come to Russia. It's going to be a massive, economic and social collapse uh, with uh, sharply rising inflation that was already very high at the beginning of this year. It's going to get worse, especially for the middle classes. And um, uh, over-compliance, companies leaving Russia, comp energy companies leaving Russia, Russian oil becoming uh, increasingly difficult to sell. So these are all ripple on effects that we haven't, I don't think we haven't seen with them all yet. Um, yeah, in short. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all three. Um, I am happy that this, your answers actually answered a lot of the questions we are seeing in the chat right now. Um, so I kind of want, us, want to point us to a more broader question, uh, and I'm really interested to see all three of your perspectives on this, but we can arguably say that we're currently witnessing tectonic shifts in the international order um, over the past one week. Um, so I really want to know, what do you think? Where are we headed? Uh, what might the world, the international order, look like in a year? Um, and how does Putin, how does Russia fit in there? 
and uh, we can go in the same order. Okay. All right. Okay. I will take that. I'll, I'll take the lead. Uh, so I think the world is like really at the threshold right now. And I think that's also comes from our conversation, right? Um, you know, I was like, I think I was optimistic by saying that NATO would have to be involved at some point because I believe in humanity and believe that um, no other country should just invade this way and, you know, you don't step up or like because also NATO would be threatened in this way because they would have all of this Russian military at the border in Belarus and in Ukraine if it's taken over. Um, so that's why I said they probably should, but the question is whether or if they would do that. And I think that fundamental question, right, do we let Putin get away with it, we already did in 2014, and we see where it led us eight years from now. So I'm afraid, so I believe that now we have like kind of like this um, really like a pivoting point as we had also during World War II, really. We either go and let him do that and then risk, if he's alive still, of course, but probably would they, I don't know. Um, risk repeating World War II just a couple of years later. Maybe it's going to be another eight years. Maybe it's going to be four years. Maybe it's going to be two years. I don't know. But it will be some amount of years um, after, for sure. Or we do our best to replace Putin's regime and have just some type of instability in Russia and just pivot toward democratization. Because I, you know, again, like toppling Putin's regime would also help to um, liberate Belarus partially at least, right? At least give it another chance, another shot to establish more democratic regime, um, which it failed after the Soviet Union, arguably. And then, you know, kind of have like some prospects for Russia. I don't know if it's gonna work in the long-term perspective, but at least there is a chance. So I think there's like some kind of similar shifts right now as we saw maybe with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, as we saw during World War II, it all depends on where we're gonna go uh, and whether Putin's regime will remain and remain on kind of punished. Yeah. So my, you know, my, my view is, just, you know, it's really early to say, obviously, we're like a week into this war, what the long term implications will, will be, of course, but some, some ideas might include, you know, one is that this invasion has, it's really changed things in Europe, you know, uh, I don't think even Europeans didn't anticipate that uh, Sweden would be sending arms, that Switzerland would be breaking neutrality principles to sanction Russia, that Germany would hike defense spending above 2%, Poland announced in defense spending above 3%, uh, maybe Finland and Sweden join NATO. I think you know, Europe is gonna take defense a lot more seriously now than it did before. I heard somebody say that 9-11, the invasion of, U of Ukraine was was Europe's 9-11. And I think there's something to that, that the world won't be the same after this. So Europe probably will move towards a more independent and muscular defense posture, um, not relying on the United States. I mean, one thing that we, we, we know is that the United States was unable to prevent war in Ukraine. I think the U.S. defense guarantee to NATO members counts for a lot, um, but the United States was not able to keep the peace in Ukraine. Europeans are going to hope that they could do it next time, right? That they could have, uh, they could contain or deter Russia next time. So that that's going to change things in Europe. Um, the, the the drift towards a more multipolar world is, doesn't end with. Europe becoming a more cohesive and muscular act of those. We also learned in the past week that India and China are not willing to side with the United States and Europe against Russia. Uh, China, maybe people would expect that, but India is the world's largest democracy, not willing to, to condemn Russia in strong terms. You know, India is not willing to do that. Um, so for people who think that this will lead to a resurgent a resurgence in US leadership and this kind of like reassertion of the, the liberal international order. I, I don't think so. I mean, India and China are the two largest states in the world and they're not, they're not aligning against Russia in an obvious fashion, at least not yet. The one silver lining might be that uh, the, norm, the norm against war might have been reinforced by this. Uh, Putin is being punished in ways that 
even those who were punishing him, punishing him, didn't think they would do. Um, you know, public opinion around the world has been outraged and appalled. And the, the lesson that other world leaders might take from this is that war doesn't pay. Um, it might be good news if you live in Taiwan, right? That China might think twice about invading Taiwan. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's the one possible silver lining is that world leaders might be reminded by this, disciplined in, in a fashion that the norm against war is strong and the, and the punishments um, are meted out, not by everyone, but by, by some. Yes, so um, I agree that uh, the shift in, in the political consensus in the EU has been uh, absolutely amazing over the past week. Uh, it is, uh, like, if you look at Germany, for instance, today's poll, uh, more than 60%, between 60 and 70% of support for 100 billion euros extra for the German army, for arms deliveries to Ukraine, uh, for Ukraine's EU accession. Again, like these are just a week ago, these have been inconceivable. It's, um, I, I don't know whether this is uh, how long this EU political consensus is going to hold, of course, but right now, it seems that we have witnessed a complete landslide. So I suspect that, uh, that, that, that the European Union, so there will be some toxicity around, apart from this, around uh, Russia, pro-Russian politicians in the foreseeable future. Whether or not that will translate to actual action against uh, dark money. And again, this is not a specifically Russian problem I want to underline. There are, there's dark money related to other countries. Uh, that's debatable. So far, we have seen some action taken, for instance, by Germany, France, uh, seizing yachts, for instance. Um, it's going to be much more difficult, as, uh, in, at least in the near term, to be a pro-Russian politician. Up until now, you could be pro-Putin and pretend that you are kind of a, uh, an anti-elitist uh, person of the people uh, kind of politician if you took that position. I don't think that's going to be possible in the future. I think uh, politicians' ties to Russia, Russian money will be under scrutiny, especially in the context of the upcoming French presidential election. Also, uh, Hungary could be a test of this. You know, I like we just mentioned very briefly here that Orban is playing a very um, uh, a delicate seesaw game, whereas uh, he is agreeing to a lot of things that he wouldn't probably have agreed without this groundswell in uh, the uh, European political consensus. But his domestic uh, communication is still very much pro Putin and uh, uh, reserved as regards help to Ukraine. So um, as for China, it, again, important part of the uh, world order, whatever uh, succeeds this war, uh, I think China's uh, relationship with Russia will be tested. Uh, Russia, it certainly is a, a relationship that was strengthened very much after 2014. It didn't amount to an alliance, but it was, uh, uh, but, but the two countries reached a sort of pragmatic uh, uh, cooperation on a number of issues, not just uh, the uh, diplomatic cooperation that uh, was there in 2014 already. But China has been very reserved. Some of its some of China, some Chinese banks have uh, withheld financing from Russian um, from Russian uh, commodities, for instance, and the uh, Chinese diplomats have been calling for uh, negotiations instead of, instead of war. So China, uh, as far as I'm not a China expert, of course, I'm just saying that uh, this is what we have seen. And uh, it sort of raised questions about how much China is able and willing to support Russia's war effort for a longer time and the, China, the Russian economy for a longer time. Thank you. Thank you all three for um, these very informative answers. Um, we are seeing a lot of excellent questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to ask all of them. So I want to ask Larissa a very quick question. Um, it's about, it's specifically about Russia. And basically it appears that Russia seems to be losing the information war right now. Um, 
basically we had this conception of Russia being a powerful information warfare uh, warfare actor. So what happened? Can you briefly uh, share your um, insights on this? Uh, yeah, happy to do that. Um, so I think it depends how we look at it. Uh, right. If we're looking for the, um, I've I've heard these opinions before, and I think it's coming from people reading um, Western news media, and that essentially, you know, they're enrobed in their own bubble um, of, you know, there's uh, everyone knows that there's no Nazi government in Ukraine. Everyone knows that they're bombing civic structures. That would not be true for every Russian, or not every single Russian at all. And I see some noddings here. So Russian propaganda is still strong in Russia itself. Unfortunately, it's also strong even among Russian residents, as I mentioned, in um, in other countries. Like I was just scrolling through my Facebook newsfeed today, and there was a comment from a woman in um, commenting kind of like aggressively on my friend's comment. So, and she lives in Dubai. She is Russian, and she says, "I don't believe your relatives also have relatives." Uh, in Ukraine and like there's no bombing and so on and so forth. So like all this Russian propaganda, um, it's effective. It's still working. And if we come to, and if it comes to this foreign audience, as I was mentioning, this narratives, the Russian propaganda, they're not blatant. They're not necessarily lying you in the face. But what they're doing and amplifying those already existing uh, divisions. That was also what we saw not just in 2014 with the Ukrainian crisis, but also what we saw with the 2016 during presidential elections in the US. It, all of the Russian trolls were not just promoting Trump. No, half of them were promoting liberal, very left-leaning liberal policies. And that explains why a lot of, for example, BLM or like some of the BLM leaders right now are siding with Putin's propaganda narrative. It's not necessarily that they are Russian puppets, but it was all like, calculated or created this way. There were a lot of Russian IRAs. There's a research paper on that, happy to direct people and email me if you need it, uh, not by me, uh, but by my colleague uh, who actually explored that Russian trolls were pre pretending to be like black American supporting the LM. So with this essentially it leaves us that all of this existing divisions within the European Union, within the United States, they can be further exacerbated by Russian propaganda. It doesn't have to look, or like Russian disinformation, it doesn't have to look like propaganda. It doesn't have to be like, to look at like fake news. It can look like absolutely legitimate information coming from grassroots, but amplified to an extent we can't talk to each other anymore. And I'm afraid that's what's happening. Uh, right now, there's more unity, obviously, against Ukraine. But if it goes on, we already see a lot of dissent in the political circles, as Andrew said, in Hungary, here in the United States, and elsewhere as well. So. Russians are more effective. I think we just um, underestimate them and look for this kind of blatant fake information um, among Western countries. And yes, they probably with that they're losing right now, but there's so much more to that. Thank you for this. And um, I believe we have time for one very quick question. Um, and I want to ask all three of you, we know since Sunday that uh, Putin raised the nuclear defense on high alert. Um, should we be worried about this in the US, in Europe, in Ukraine, the rest of the world? Is this a plausible threat? Is this something that you see Putin doing? Has he lost his mind? Or is this a bluff to deter the West from acting? Uh, we can start from Andras this time because Larissa just ended. I mean, Obviously, we should be very worried about this. I, like it's uh, it's 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 obviously possible not to be worried about this. Um, I think um, we rather like we, we need to understand what happened obviously on Sunday uh, in just very um, plain terms. Uh, Putin did raise the preparedness one notch, which means that we are one notch closer to launching. Uh, uh, strategic deterrence weapons, nukes included. Uh, this does not mean that we are, uh, you know, in the eleventh hour from uh, like or like one step away from nuclear warfare, but we are closer. So we obviously have to be worried about that. I think um, we. Uh, I, this is a very difficult question. Uh, what can we do to 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 deter that? I think. Um, um, like we have to calculate our risks. We have talked about 
uh, the no-fly zone, we have talked about weapons deliveries. Uh, that's, the, that's basically the best we can do. And the other thing is a very important thing is that I think uh, I read news today, uh, someone will confirm or, 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 or correct me if I'm wrong, but that uh, communication between uh, the Russian army and the US army has been reestablished. Uh, so uh, that is an important uh, thing if it is actually happening uh, in, uh, to avoid situations in which uh, miscalculation can lead to something, something much, much worse than what we are in even now. Yeah, my, my view is that what, what Putin was trying to do is remind people in the West and especially the Western media that he has nuclear weapons um, and therefore NATO should not involve itself in this conflict. Um, I mean, there are people on cable news talking about NATO should establish no-fly zones, that, you know, why are we letting these convoys drive across Ukraine when the NATO's combined air force could blow them up? Uh, he, he wants to remind people, ordinary people in, in the West, um, you shouldn't be making those suggestions because I have nuclear weapons. Um, I think that's essentially what he was trying to do. Just, just my, that's just my take. Thank you, Peter. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, Dom, do you want to say la any last words or? No, thank you so much, Yuran, for, for moderating the Q&A. And thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, thank you for sharing your expertise. I know we had a lot of people join us and, and it was really, really great. So thank you again. Thank you all for coming. And uh, thank you.